from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first lesson today is the text for this sermon. So keep Jeremiah in the back of your mind. We've all experienced times when life is tough. Sometimes it's been so tough we feel no joy at all. And without joy, we don't feel like singing. And when the song goes, so does our confidence. We never sit quite so easy in the saddle again. Or if we've been thrown from the horse once, we can be thrown from the horse again. Leads us to view the future with, as Cameron Murchison calls it, a pervasive agnosticism. I'll get back to that in a minute. Some people never get past that agnosticism. The hardship they experience can lead to anger and bitterness. Let's face it, sometimes life can be cruel and unfair. We often may say, I didn't ask for this, or I don't deserve this, or why me, perhaps is more common. Thorin Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, once described a man who lived his life as if he were a typographical error. Look at me, he cried. Look at God's great mistake. I'm living proof that God neither catches nor rectifies every error, every omission, or every wrong. That is the gist of pervasive agnosticism. That kind of anger can very often lead to despair. In our first lesson today, we're served a slice of the great Hebrew prophet Jeremiah. Before his life was finished in history, he said and did some amazing things. But Jeremiah also got horribly down on himself. He got down on life in general and in God in particular. The situation sometimes was so difficult and his list of complaints so long that we have coined the word in English, Jeremiad. It means a long mournful complaint or lamentation, a long list of woes, all because of the hardships that Jeremiah faced as God called him to proclaim to the Israelites that the Babylonian captivity was coming. Few, if any, believed him. Let me read a bit from this chapter 20 that we just, after what we've stopped. Here's what the prophet laments. A curse on the day I was born on the day my mother bore me, on the man who brought my father the news. Why did that man not kill me in the womb so that the womb would have been my tomb? Why did I ever come out to live in toil and sorrow to the end of my days in shame? Jeremiah was beaten, jailed, he was put at the bottom of a well. People lowered food to him in a bucket. All because he proclaimed that the kingdom of Israel was about to be invaded by the Babylonians. His is more than pervasive agnosticism. It's actually a regret about the past. Jeremiah spoke those words. He did not just sit and stare. He lamented. To be clear, not everyone turns to anger and despair. Some folks turn to fatalism. I read a story of the baptism of King Agnes by St. Patrick. I heard sometime in the fifth century 
During the baptism, St. Patrick leaned on his sharp-pointed staff and inadvertently stabbed the king's foot. After the baptism was over, St. Patrick noticed blood around the king's foot and on the ground. Realizing what he had done, he begged the king's forgiveness. Then he asked the king, why did you suffer in silence? The king replied, I thought it was part of the ritual. <laughs> Many people think that way sometimes. They think that pain is part of the ritual and the inadvertent stabbings of life go without, they just go with the territory. And there's no use saying anything because we're dealt, the hand we're dealt with. God has stacked life against us. Not so. Let me try to illustrate. Norman Cousins tells about a time when he was 10 years old. He had tuberculosis and was sent to a sanitarium. He was terribly frail. He was underweight. And as he arrived at the sanitarium, he quickly saw that his fellow patients were neatly divided into two separate groups. One group consisted of those who were confident they would beat the disease. Those in the other group resigned themselves to a prolonged and even fatal illness. Cousins noted that the optimistic ones quickly became good friends and had very little to do with those who resigned themselves to the worst. Then he adds, when newcomers arrived on the floor, we did our best to recruit them before the bleak brigade could go to work. Make no mistake about it. In life, the bleak brigade is out there for us, even as it was for him. But Cousins goes on to say, even at the age of 10, I became aware that the boys in my group had a far higher percentage of discharged as cured outcomes than the kids in the other group. And the lessons I learned about hope in that sanitarium played an important role in my life and in my recovery and my feelings since that time. I now view life as something very precious. Don't miss the irony in that. For in the aftermath of being roughed up by the illness, tuberculosis, being shipped off to a sanitarium, where frankly it's probably easier to stare than sing, while fending off the boys from the bleak brigade, cousins realized that life was incredibly, incredibly precious and it should be enjoyed for the gift that it is. Following Cousins, Bernie Siegel, doctor, taught a course on his book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles. Siegel built a career on the lessons Norman Cousins learned in that sanitarium and in his subsequent work as a clinician, especially as it concerns his involvement with a group of people he calls exceptional cancer patients. They're deemed exception, exceptional not because of their medical prognosis, but because of the deep optimism they bring to the fight. Legal rights, to find out whether you have the outlook of an exceptional patient Ask yourself a simple question. It actually serves as the title for this sermon. Do you want to live to be 100? When I sent that in to Celeste in the office, she quickly answered back, no. 
But in the exceptional patients group, the answer there was an immediate visceral yes. Siegel went on to say that most of us will answer the question yes with qualifications, but seldom with a visceral yes. We will say, of course, I'd like to be 100. If you can guarantee I'll be healthy, of course, I'd like to be 100. If you can guarantee I won't be alone, so I'd like to be 100 if I won't outlive my savings. But the exceptional group, an unconditional yes. Honestly, there's nothing magical about being 100. No one wants to simply hang on and hang on for the sake of hanging on. That's not really life. Most of us will reach a point where life's preciousness is compromised by our loss of mind or function, and our letting go becomes an act of faith, not an act of surrender. But when exceptional patients let go, it's not out of fear, it's out of fatigue. The people wishing to reach 100 are not blind to life's circumstances. They want to go out, not as frightened lambs, but as terrified tigers, or as triumphant tigers, tired tigers. They're not unrealistic about the pitfalls life throws at us. They've chosen to take life as it comes, without holding out for better terms which means they know that life itself is the gift, not the better terms. Whatever our circumstances, we should not look a gift life in the mouth. Annie Dillard writes, I'd like to imagine that the dying pray at the last, not please, but thank you. Thank you for simply giving me the privilege of being invited to the party. In one sense, I understand and like her message. In many of the wedding receptions I've attended, I leave early for a couple of reasons. One, so those who else who are at the party can feel free to party on without the pastor kind of taking notes there. <laughs> but I also want to appear bright-eyed and bushy-tailed on Sunday morning, or and at least moderately intelligent when I do so. Just before leaving, I seek the host or hostess, or both, and thank them for the privilege of attending. But while that image of Annie Dillard speaks to me, there is a small part of it that's uncomfortable for me. My problem is not with thanking the host. The problem is with leaving the party too early. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to thank the host now, later, today, tomorrow, daily, continually, weekly, monthly, yearly, however. But if it's all right with the host, I really prefer to stick around a while. Maybe, just maybe, even until I reach the century mark. I'd like to close with what I'll call a few applications here from the life of Jeremiah. One, doing the right thing does not guarantee us an easy life. In fact, it's often the opposite. Two, Jeremiah gives us the freedom to vetch and complain to God about our circumstances. After expressing our pain to God, we then move to trust God for the outcome. Four, we learn from Jeremiah that every last one of us will fall apart sometimes. But when we do, 
God is there waiting for us to return, lifting us and offering renewed life. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus.